Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to ER Vet on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Justine Lee, and I'm an emergency critical care specialist and toxicologist. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about what it's like to be a veterinary technician in the veterinary space. We'll be right back after these messages. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. When we put him on the Dynavite, he took right to it. All of these symptoms disappeared. Dynavite is nutrition. If you want the dog to be healthy, you got to feed it something healthy. Something that he actually likes to eat. You need to put him on Dynavite. Dynavite for life. If you love your dog, you don't just want him healthy, you want him to be happy. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to ER Vet on Pet Life Radio. Really excited to have Amy Newfield, who's a fellow veterinary colleague, on with us today. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Amy, you have a lot of initials behind your name. I know you're a certified veterinary technician, and you're also a veterinary technician specialist in emergency and critical care. Because our audience doesn't know who you are, do you mind just explaining who you are, how long you've been a veterinary technician for, and what those extra letters mean and what you do now? Yes, I would be happy to. So I graduated from college in 1998. So I've been a technician now for officially 22 years. And becoming a credentialed or certified veterinary technician involves sitting for a national board exam. And then the rest of the letters after that, the veterinary technician specialist means that I have specialized in one department in a, and usually a large hospital that has various departments, much like a human healthcare system. So you have radiology of oncology and then emergency. But in order to earn those extra letters after your name, you have to be in the specialty for a minimum of three years and then complete at least a year-long application process and then sit for a grueling day-long board exam so that you can get your extra letters after your name. So that's all the extra letters that I have after my name. Hopefully that explains it a little bit better. Thank you. And I know you from the veterinary space, but you have served as a board position in the Academy of Veterinary Emergency Critical Care Technicians. You've published, you're an international speaker, you've won a lot of awards. And what do you practice and what do you do right now? Yeah, so right now I work for Blue Pearl Veterinary Partners. It is a specialty-only company, so we only do specialty medicine, and by that I mean emergency critical care. And then, like I said, it's very similarly structured to a human healthcare system. So we have radiologists, we have oncologists, we have internal medicine doctors, we've got surgeons. So it's a a very large building (laughs) with a lot of different specialties in there. And yes, I've had many opportunities to get to lecture and go to various conferences throughout the world. I do publish quite a bit and I'm very active in all various committees and organizations in the veterinary technician space. Before we dig in, what do you do for fun and what kind of pets do you have? Oh, great question. So currently I have two dogs and they're high energy dogs. And luckily I describe myself as a border collie. So only fitting that I own a border collie. And then my second dog is a mini Australian shepherd. So they are high strung, high energy dogs. And what I like to do is trail run in the woods with my dogs. I think that's one of the most relaxing things that anyone can ever do, which it sounds counterproductive, but it is very relaxing to just be with yourself and your dogs in the woods running through the 
the the woods is amazing. So that's one thing that I do. I actually do scuba dive year round here in New England. So that's super fun as well. And I describe myself as a chocoholic. So I'm pretty much always eating chocolate, but then that helps to get me motivated for running, I guess. So yeah. And they, uh, both dogs also do agility. So they compete in agility, which keeps them super busy. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. So I wanted to have you on today because obviously all our listeners on ER Vet are pet lovers, whether or not they're dogs, cats, birds, lizards, anything. And previously, we've had a few episodes where we've interviewed um, some people in different aspects of the animal world, whether or not it's animal rescue or veterinarians or veterinary specialists or practice owners. But I've never had a veterinary technician on and you guys are the right hand to my left. And I just wanted to talk about the job opportunities out there. Now, can you give us a little bit of background about the education and the training. I know yours is a bit unique, but I wanted you to explain what someone would need to do in order to become a certified veterinary technician and be able to work with animals. And then if you could tell us what you do on a day-to-day basis. Yes, absolutely. So we have a lot of different titles for the title of veterinary technician here in the United States. It's a little bit confusing, and I think that's why the general public struggles to identify with us in terms of what we can do. But in all 50 states, there is some sort of credentialing process that veterinary technicians can go through. If you don't meet the requirements to sit for the actual national exam, then you should be called a veterinary assistant. Assistant. But depending on the state that you might reside in, some states are pretty loose with that title. So you might have someone who's never gone to school and actually has no formal training and never took that national exam doing almost the same exact job as to someone who has. So it is a very confusing career, but I'm a credentialed veterinary technician. There's also registered veterinary technicians. There's licensed veterinary technicians, and then there's licensed veterinary medical technicians. So we currently have four different titles in the United States for this one job. So if you ever hear any of those <laughs> those terms, they're all synonymous, but they are dependent on the state at which you reside in. So in order to get those credentials right now, you have to go to school and then sit for that national exam. It's called the Veterinary Technician National Exam. And if you don't, ideally you call yourself a veterinary assistant. The nice thing about those who have gone on to school is they've gotten either two or four year college education. It is dependent on the college and what they offer. And they learn everything from anatomy, physiology, to anesthesia, to pharmacology, all of those wonderful things. And I describe my job in the things I can't do because it it's confusing to explain to the public that all the things we can do. So very simply put, being a veterinary technician, you can do everything in the veterinary hospital except you cannot prescribe drugs. So the prescription has to come from a veterinarian. You can't do surgery and you cannot diagnose. And so those are the three things that we cannot do. But everything else is pretty much done by a veterinary technician. So it's a pretty cool and awesome job. We are the people who usually you see first, we say hello, we might do a quick physical exam, but then we also monitor your pet's anesthesia. We take all the x-rays for your pet. We're the one who helps them go outside. If they're staying hospitalized in our hospitals, we're going to be the one to walk the dog or take care of the cat. We probably have far more pet interaction and hands-on as veterinary technicians than our veterinarians do. So hopefully that describes a little bit about our job and everything we can do and the education that's required to becoming a credentialed veterinary technician. Thank you so much. Now, how is this different from human nursing? Ah, very good question. So human nurses tend to be a lot more specialized. When they come out and they graduate, they tend to go into one thing. It might just be general practice, but that general practice nurse will do limited things because our general practice human doctors do very limited things. In a general practice veterinary hospital setting, your veterinary technician, aka your veterinary nurse basically, 
is doing a lot more skill sets. So they can do dental profies, so your routine dental cleanings. They'll actually also do laboratory work. So they will be the person to sit in front of a microscope and say your dog or your cat has roundworms a lot of the time. They might be the person to draw the blood and submit it out to a lab, especially for heartworm tests. They're probably going to be the ones to do this. And they're also going to be the person to be your anesthesiologist for your pet when they undergo spay and neuter. And so our general practice veterinarians do a lot more compared to our general practice human healthcare professionals because our human healthcare professionals that are doing, you know, regular physical exams, they're not also doing surgery as well as your dentals, as well as all of that stuff. So it is a lot different because we have to have a wider skill set, but they are very similarly aligned because whatever a nurse can do, pretty much a veterinary technician can do, but we have to do it all. So (laughs) that's how I always describe the differences between the two. We'll continue with our really cool topic right after these messages from our sponsors. Hey everyone, Michelle Fern here. I have the perfect gift for Mother's Day. You know, I can't visit my mother-in-law as much as I'd like to, and that's why I love the Skylight Frame. It's a touchscreen photo frame that you can email photos to, and they appear in seconds, so my mother-in-law can see the pictures right away. And I have a great savings for you. Just go to skylightframe.com slash pet and you'll save $10. That's right. S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E dot com slash pet, P-E-T, and you'll save $10. And get ready to receive sheer happiness thank yous from your recipient because they will love this. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to ER Vet on Pet Life Radio. Really honored to have Amy Newfield, who's a certified veterinary technician and a veterinary technician specialist in the field of emergency critical care on today's show. We've already talked about the education that's involved with being a veterinary technician, the options to be able to become a specialist in the veterinary technician field and how it's different from human nursing. I did want to ask you now in terms of opportunities out there, I know you specifically specialize in emergency critical care. In general practice, we've talked about veterinary technicians being able to do dental profies, so cleaning of teeth, doing blood work, helping run laboratory things. What else on a day-to-day basis should someone know before they consider going into the field of being a veterinary technician? Great question. So I think the two things that people should consider before going into the field of veterinary technology is, one, you must love pets. And then the other thing is you also really must love medicine because there's plenty of careers out there where you can just work with animals, but there's no medical side of it. This is truly a combination of both. And so you're going to see a lot of sick pets. You're going to have to deal with upset owners and rightfully so because these are their furry babies. And so for all of you pet owners, I'm a pet owner as well. So this is my furry child and and we totally have to know how to handle the client and we have to handle the pet. And so I always compare it very much so to almost pediatric medicine in human medicine because our pediatric nurses and even our pediatric doctors have to deal with obviously the mom and the dad, the parent, but then also treating that pediatric patient that can't speak for themselves. So it's a very similar subset when we look at it in terms of pediatric medicine comparatively to veterinary medicine. I think that the other things to consider is that you're going to be working and standing on your feet a lot. There's a lot of on your feet. You have to figure out how to work with animals in a way that is kind and also keeps you safe because you have a lot of angry cats. And I always think that cats are probably the smartest of the bunch because they know that the veterinary hospital is not a fun place to be at. So they tend to be the crankiest customers and that's okay. So absolutely got to give it to the tiny cat who, who wants to defend itself. So, but how do you work around that? And what does that look like? I 
am the cliche veterinary technician. My parents will tell you that I went into this industry knowing that I was always going to work with animals. Even from early ages, when they say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'd say, I want to help animals. And I didn't know really what that meant in my younger years. But as I've gotten into the veterinary profession, it's kind of ironic because I love animals. I've given my life to helping them in this profession, and I wouldn't change it for the world. But ironically, when you work in a veterinary clinic, they do not like you. <laughs> and so I think that when I first came out of college, I thought all the dogs and cats were going to thank me and it was going to be great and they were going to love me. And I was going to get dog kisses and cats were going to rub up next to me purring. And then the reality quickly came <laughs> into my life that the dogs and cats that I interact with at the veterinary hospital really don't like me. Um, and I still have to manage to do my job in despite of that. Every so often we get a very happy dog or cat, but a lot of them, and rightfully so, are afraid. They know it's not a fun place to be. And so we have to comfort them and do the best we can. So I think that's my advice to anybody going into this industry is that it's not playing with puppies and kittens. That's not what we're doing. We have to practice medicine, a high level of care and medicine to these patients. And how do we do that and do it as comfortably as possible with an animal that doesn't necessarily want anything done to them? So, and you have to juggle that all the time. You brought up some great points. I also wanted to bring up two things that I'm sure you battle and hear about all the time. First, you probably get sick of hearing, why didn't you want to become a vet? And talk to me about money and salary. Oh, two very good topics. So yes, I have lost count how many times people have said to me, why don't you want to become a vet? And here's my stance on that. One, it's insulting. So don't tell, don't ask a veterinary technician why they don't want to become a vet because it automatically kind of demoralizes their job as if what they're doing is not good enough. Like, you know, so I always say you can certainly you know, ask someone that you might be really good friends with, but otherwise stay away from that topic because it's a pretty hot topic with veterinary technicians. Why I didn't want to become a veterinarian is simple. I really love the nursing care aspect of this career and I wouldn't change it for the world and no offense to you or any of the other veterinarians. I don't want to become a veterinarian. It's not anything that's ever crossed my mind. I always describe to people who ask that question to me, I say, let me tell you what I do. And very simply, when an animal comes in, I'm probably one of the first people that says hello to you. And I'll probably be the person to get you in a room and pet your animal first and say hello to you and ask you why you're here. And then the veterinarian's going to come in and maybe your pet is scheduled for a spay or a neuter that day, or maybe they're getting a dental cleaning. At the end of that time with that veterinarian, I'll probably be the one to take the pet to the back and make up its cage and get everything ready and try to make it as comfortable as possible. And the veterinarian is going to write down all the things they want to do, maybe some drugs for anesthesia, maybe some pain medications, maybe that pet needs some blood work, or maybe it needs an intravenous catheter, but they're going to write down all the things they want to do. And then they're going to move on to the next client and the next pet. And unless there's a veterinary technician to take that information and do all of those things, nothing actually gets done with that pet. And so I'm the person who does all that stuff. So that's how I always explain my job to people who say, why didn't you want to become a veterinarian? I say, I have a really amazing job. I would never want to change it for the world. Now, the second part of that question that you asked is about salary. So the good news is this. There are plenty of jobs for veterinary technicians. In fact, we are in a shortage in pretty much every hospital. So if you are interested in joining a college or a program and learning how to become a veterinary technician, I promise you there are so many jobs. And the nice thing about it is what you can do as a veterinary technician is vast. The government hires veterinary technicians, research hires veterinary technicians. You can pick a species that you want to work with. You can go into large animal, small animal, exotics. You can decide just to work with felines if you wanted to. Zoo medicines, 
aquatics. It's crazy the amount of things that you can do. And you can work for a small practice that's just owned by one owner all the way up to a gigantic corporation. Or like I said, even the government hires veterinary technicians. So the industry has a lot of jobs and the growth is actually growing at a faster rate than most professions. But we are definitely in a shortage. There's simply not enough credentialed veterinary technicians to go around. So every hospital struggles with being short-staffed. Now, in terms of pay, (sighs) I'm going to sigh there. That was a very deep sigh. Um, I'm sighing with you. Yeah, it's true. Veterinary technicians struggle to be financially stable. Most veterinary technicians have at least two jobs in order to be able to meet ends meet. The starting salaries are low, and these are individuals who have a college education. And it's really a disappointing thing. I'm tired of the words industry standards. It's not acceptable anymore. Um, So it's really, it is a big problem in this industry of how we utilize technicians and we want to utilize them. And they're coming out with these amazing educations and they're doing all of these medical procedures and pet owners want credentialed technicians to be the ones monitoring their anesthesia. Because if not then we go back to what we used to do back in the 1970s and 80s, which was it was just your friend who knew nothing about anesthesia, who may or may not have just graduated from high school, who's giving drugs and monitoring your pet's anesthesia, and then our anesthetic death rates go up. So it is a very important industry to have veterinary technicians, and I know the public would want credentialed veterinary technicians to be the ones who have an education, who's passed this exam, this national exam, to do these higher end procedures and things. But unfortunately, the pay is really low. And so most veterinary technicians do have to have two jobs in order to live. That's just the reality of the profession. And it's really disappointing. It is just not a sustainable salary. Like a lot of veterinary technicians that I work with only make 15 to maybe 20 an hour. And that's with shift diff, which means that they are working overnights or late night shifts or from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. Of course, that's in an emergency setting. So traditionally, most veterinary technicians are working at general practices where it may be more traditional hours from 8a to 5 p.m. But the hours are long. And so it is really frustrating. I do agree there needs to be a massive increase in salary. It's not a sustainable salary for the majority of people unless you're dual income and you marry rich, which is always the ideal. But whatever. That's another topic. (laughs) Any other tips you want to leave with us when it comes to people who are considering this for a future field? It's obviously something that is so important. Again, you guys are the right hand uh, to everything that I do. We veterinarians couldn't survive without you. But any last tips you want to leave us with? I think the biggest thing is that this is an amazing profession. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it's not sustainable in terms of what people are making for salary right now. And it does need to change because this is a very much needed profession. As if a pet owner, I would encourage you to ask your hospital how many credentialed veterinary technicians they have in the hospital, how many of them actually have gone to school, because that's really important. Knowing who your pet is being monitored by for their general anesthesia is a really big deal because I don't think a lot of pet owners realize that it could be somebody right out of high school who has no medical knowledge, who has no training, who doesn't even understand pharmaceutical drugs, who is the one who's monitoring a pet's anesthesia. And so I think if pet owners request credentialed veterinary technicians more than veterinarians need to hire credentialed veterinary technicians more. And therefore, hopefully the salaries will go up. And so that's where I see the sustainability actually happening in the future. But this is a relatively new profession. Our first college opened up in 1970s, so it's not a very old profession. And I also think there's been a huge shift in dynamic between that pet owner bond. I know that when I was a kid growing up, my beagle could just run around the neighborhood and we hoped she came back. (laughs) Now I don't let my dogs out of my sight because they're my children and uh, they're my wonderful furry kids and I am completely addicted to them in a good way. So they go everywhere with me and they are truly ingrained in the family, which is really important. And I think that 
when pet owners demand that better care and that excellence of care for their pets, that that will help to drive up the salaries. I think come into this profession if you love pets, but you also are prepared to help them through medicine. It's one of the most rewarding things you could ever do to and take care of a pet through your veterinary technician skills when they're really sick, watch them get better and see the joy on an owner's face when you give that pet back to them and know that you got to bring that owner back to their pet and keep that bond strong. That I can't even describe the feeling. I mean, it's, I smile every single time that I the owner and say, you get to go home and you see that smile on the owner's face. That's priceless. And even though we don't get paid that much, Honestly, it's worth it because that just makes me smile every time. I know that I've gotten that pet back to the owner and now they have that bond and they can keep on having that bond for hopefully many more years to come. Well, Amy, thank you so much for what you do. And to all the veterinary technicians out there, thank you for doing what you do. It's a labor of love. And I know it sounds, quote, trite to say it, but you really are so vital to the veterinary community and to pet owners out there. And we couldn't do our jobs without you. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. Find me at drjustinelee.com, on Facebook at Dr. Justine Lee, or email me any of your pet questions at drjustine at petliferadio.com. With that, we're out of time, and we want to thank our guest, Amy Newfield, vet tech extraordinaire, and Mark Winter, our producer, for making this show possible. See you at the next episode. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.